Hey, it's Zach, and I'm back with another episode of Elevate and Accelerate. And I'm really excited to be introducing you today to a really good friend of mine and somebody who I've had an opportunity to talk with a couple of times here. Um, I've read her book, Life Hacks uh, for Hard Times, which is actually amazing. Um, there's such uh, great information there. And she's going to share a lot of that with us today, as well as her story and what brought her to a place where she has inspired, helped, um, and really challenged people to uh, to gain wisdom from their own journey, um, as she has uh, so well today. So, uh, Christy, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, really excited to, to dive into your story and, and your wisdom. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so like I said, uh, your book, Life Hacks for Hard Times, um, is 27 proven and practical tips for people and how they can overcome adversity and kind of move through their life's journey uh, in an empowering way. And so what you did is you had broke that up into, you know, three different sections of see, believe, and do. Um, and so can you kind of tell me a little bit about like what those three categories are and how you landed on them? Sure. Yeah, actually, that was my husband's brilliant idea. But I, <laughs> two years ago, when I wrote this book, I I started reflecting back on all the different life challenges that I'd faced over the last two, three decades. And I started to realize that the tools that I use to get out and through those challenges and become a better person because of them were all the same tools. They just, you know, I use them in different ways at different times. And so, you know, when I mind mapped out what all these tools look like, then Matt and I, my husband looked at it and we were like, he's like, this really is three sections, you know? And so the C section is, you know, things like you have to first identify the truth of the situation. You can't argue with reality. We have to understand where we're at in the situation. We have to gain self-awareness, perspective, look at our options, things like that. And so what I find with people is sometimes why people are stuck in their heart is because they may be working well in one of these three sections or two of these three sections, but they're missing a piece of the puzzle. And when mm -hmm. I did this live, even I've had people, you know, you've ever put a puzzle together and you're missing a piece. That's like the most frustrating <laughs> thing. So but frustrating. Yeah, we, yes. We all live like that so many times. And so the, and then when you, move from the C section, when you finally have the right perspective, you kind of see things for what they really are, then you can transition into the belief section, which is really focused on our mindset and what we're telling ourselves, what we're believing, you know, finding opportunity in the challenge, growing through things, things like tools like that, that we'll get more into on this podcast. But, and then you focus into the largest section of my book because I'm an action oriented person, but that's the do section because you can have, see things clearly, and you can believe all day long, but if you don't actually do something with that, you're still going to stay stuck. And so those, the tools in that do section were just real practical, simple, tangible things that I've used, you know, for the last 20 plus years in my own life and have helped my clients overcome their challenges. So that's kind of how we broke that book up um, into the sections to kind of make it make sense and help people identify whether it's re through reading my book or in a workshop, like maybe which section they're really stuck in. I love that. And um, it makes it really easy for people to understand. And we'll kind of dive into each of those categories and maybe a couple of chapters in there that I think would be really helpful for our listeners to uh, to be equipped with tools to, to kind of face their own challenges and things that they might be going through. But um, I think one of the most important things and something that we talk about very often on this podcast is, is really story and how story and our perspective on story influences a lot of these things. And I know having talked to you that, you know, there was a there was a pivotal moment in your life that kind of set you on this journey of now, you know, sharing your wisdom from stage to large audiences and, and coaching programs and all the things that you really offer to help people now because of your journey. Mm -hmm. But but that's where you are now. But it all kind of started, you know, you're lying on the floor, uh, ready to take your life kind of, you know, facing those challenges and not knowing, you know, what the answers were. And, and you had a vision, right? And this vision was was to help people. So kind of describe to me, you know, what that moment was like. Um, and then let's kind of talk through some of the things that kind of led you to that point in your life in the first place. Sure. Yeah, this so that moment was probably about four years into a seven year mental health battle and physical health battle that I was facing. And I was pretty much in a debilitated state literally every day with survival and just fighting to just barely function. And I, you know, and I, you know, at some point when you get that worn out, <laughs> you start to lose your fight and you start to not know what else to do when you're in that state. And, and I, I remember the, the day clearly or night clear. I don't remember if it was night or day, but I was laying on my hardwood floor in my bedroom 
And just in the middle of a full-fledged panic and anxiety attack, which I was used to living with those several times a day. And mm. I just remember like being at one of those moments where I was like, I can't do this one more day. Like literally I would continue to beg God to not let me wake up the next day because I'm like, I can't keep fighting this torment. And I've went through a lot prior to all that, which I'll get into, but this was just like the hardest and longest battle of my life. And and I remember like thinking, I just need to end it all and doing this. And in the middle of like shaking and panicking and hardly hyperventilating. And I remember seeing myself on a stage talking to people. And I remember like somewhere deep inside me below all the panic and the irrational fear and everything that was going through me, um, telling myself, Christy, you have got to continue to fight to the other side of this because there's other people that are in the same situation that you're in and they don't know how to get out of it either. But if you can fight and overcome and get to the other side of it and you're willing to share your story, which I have always been because it's why I do what I do, but then I can get to the other side and help other people. And that vision that day has kept me going. It kept me going for the next three years to actually turn the corner in that battle. And then it's kept me going as I've rebuilt my life and my business and my mindsets and a whole, and everything else for the last nine years. Um, even on my hard days, like, and you know, I remember that vision of like, no, this is why I went through what I went through to be able to do what I'm doing now. So yeah. And we'll, we'll kind of get to how people can do that and some strategies on, and some practical tips on, on how they might be able to start turning that quarter, um, and, and how that all kind of gains with, uh, or starts with gaining perspective, but you know, we don't start in those places. Um, and look, I'm, yes. I'm a veteran, um, and you know, the suicide rate among veterans is, is astronomical, right. Um, and the numbers people are typically fight on, but it's anywhere from 20 to 40 a day of uh, veterans who are taking their own lives and, and struggling with stuff like this. But, but PTS or PTSD and, and, um, and trauma and all these kinds of things are, are rampant in people and they don't know how to deal with it or what yes. to do with it. Um, but it's, it's a process, right? Like, it's like, you don't, you're not born wanting to take your own life and, and right. sort of being depressed. And so, you know, kind of walk us through your journey. Like what was early life like for you? What, what was, you know, where did you grow up? What were, you know, what were kind of some of the, the things you enjoyed and challenges you faced then? Yeah. Early life was good for me from an outside perspective. And, you know, and if I grew up outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I, I had great parents. They're still alive today. They, I've got a lot of things from them. Um, my work ethic, you know, my integrity, my compassion and, you know, generosity towards others and all things were things I've learned in childhood. But you know, I learned along the way that your parents and, and you as a person, you can, you can't give what you don't have. And because of their upbringings and their things, you know, there was a certain level of maybe relational and emotional intelligence that they just didn't have. And they weren't able to give me those things. But yet here, you know, Christy comes into the world and I'm a very motivated, driven, you know, high energy, emotional person. That's like, you know, ready to change the world at, you know, 12 years old. And, and I don't know what to do with all of that, you know, and I remember and, and growing up in a religious atmosphere, which my faith is a huge part of my life, but I've had to undo a lot of the wrong thinking with that along the way as well. And, yeah. and so, you know, it, it was kind of the perfect storm internally for me in my teenage years where I started battling with some OCD and things, but I didn't even know to call it OCD then. I, I just kind of chalked it up as this is my little bit of crazy, but it's not stopping me from living my life. And I don't know who to even talk to about this. So I just kind of put it in the back of my head and I kept on going and I went on mission trips and I ran summer feeding programs for inner city ch children. And I just did everything. And then I got married at a young age at 18, about to turn 19 and relocated my life to St. Louis. And, and through those years, early years of my marriage, again, here I am like ready to change the world. And I married a man who like, barely got himself to work every day. And that was about all he was interested in. And, wow. but I didn't know what I knew, you know, about self-awareness and personal development and marriage and all of that stuff, you know, 30 years later that then, and so it caused a lot of tension in our marriage and friction. And I wanted, you know, I never wanted to live status quo. I wanted to change the world. I had big plans, lots mm. of dreams. And, and so things got rocky and I continued to fight at that point, started fighting for the marriage and just trying to make it what I thought it should be. And, and, but it takes two. <laughs> and, and so it just, it didn't work. And along through that process, there were some other things. We ended up in a bad house deal that cost us a lot of money and a couple of years of our life and in a lawsuit. And it was just a whole bunch of, ugh, that I wasn't expecting in my early twenties. I thought, you know, I'm young, I'm married, I'm going to go change the world. And then life started throwing me some curveballs and I started making some wrong decisions and I started paying for the consequences of those decisions. And, you know, and then I got into an, um, 
So basically I gave my husband an ultimatum and said, either we work this, you like, we make this marriage, but it should be, or, or I'm out. And, you know, he decided he wanted to be out. And so, you know, a few months later we ended up divorced, but in the process of that, I made a, a worse decision in having an affair with my, one of my best friends. And, and that relationship was full of lies and manipulation and everything that an affair comes with. And that year of my life really rocked my world <laughs> and, um, at an internal level. And then, so I'm still carrying carrying all this baggage from my childhood into this, you know, and then that ended. And, you know, the night that that ended, I was a, a still Christy, the emotional, you know, driven, same person I am today. I'm just more refined today, but I didn't know what to do with all these emotions and things. And, and so then I relocated back to Pittsburgh and met my current husband. Well, at that point, you know, Matt didn't know what he was getting into. He was 27. He had never been, he had one girlfriend his entire life. So we were like opposite sides of these, you know, he's an engineer. He's calm, laid back, steady Eddie. Like, I don't think he's cried like two days in his life, you know? <laughs> and so, and then he meets me, you know, and then all of a sudden we decide to get married and I'm at the beginning of this nervous breakdown that I don't realize is coming. Like you said, you don't see it coming. And so I get remarried, I relocate, I start my own business, I'm working a full-time job, I start to try to fight infertility. And so I go through all this, I finally fix my infertility issues, I finally have our first child, um, all my kids were born at home by my choice. And, and so I'm going through all this, but in the process of having all these kids, I just, I felt like, it felt like I woke up one day, like this driven person running a business, raising a family, going to homeschool my kids, you know, wanting a great marriage, all this stuff, wanted to build orphanages. I had a goal list as long, I mean, it was a binder. And, hmm. and then one day I was sitting in the corner debilitated with panic and anxiety and OCD, you know, but it had built, it had accumulated up over the years. And so, you know, so then that just a quick question on that. Yeah. yeah like, so, so you're obviously running us through a long journey and a long process mm -hmm. of different stuff. And, and I know because of our limited time, we're getting in here, but it, it sounds like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of like this idea of all of these different things are happening, but because you didn't have context for it or an yes. understanding from like OCD to the emotions that were going on inside of you and all this stuff, it was like, if I don't know what to do with it, the only thing I can do is just kind of is either bury it or like mm -hmm. take that energy and put it into something else, which is, I would imagine where a lot of that, that drive and focus and energy yes. for that drive was coming from, but yes. it was, but it was built on you know, on sand essentially, right. It was, Correct. it was kind of a house being built on, you know, this, this turbulence, um, mm -hmm. that eventually was, was, you know, was going to break down and crack. And, and that's right. kind of what you got to, right. was in this, yes. you know, it was kind of building in, inside, um, all yes. the way up until that moment. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, and it led me to that seven year, you know, breakdown where it was like, it felt like it happened overnight, but as I looked back and has rebuilt my life, I could see, you know, how it didn't really happen overnight it led me to that, you know, and, and in that fight, it was like, I, I never wanted to just put a bandaid on it. I was like my body, my mind, my emotions are trying to tell me something here. What are they trying mm. to tell me? Unfortunately, it took me seven years to figure that out, you know, <laughs> and get results and ended up with my husband quitting his job to come home to take care of me. And, you know, on and on and on the list goes, but, and so that led us to sell everything and take life on the, we bought an old paid for RV and we took our kids and we started traveling um, for a few months, which turned into a few years. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's just, it's been one challenge after the other, but like through it all, I feel like I have become, you know, we were talking with a friend the other night at dinner and he was going through some serious challenges himself. And he's like, this is like a college degree that I would have never signed up for. <laughs> like I would have never yeah. said, yes, yeah, sign me up. I want to do this. But he's like, I don't think I would undo it because it has made me the person I am at this moment. And I, and I think that's, um, that's a great segue kind of into, into the next part of this, but I want to sort of summarize for our listeners and, and kind of knowing some of your context too, sort of what this is. And that's like, you, you personally have gone through so many different challenges from, from starting businesses to losing businesses to, you know, having a home, losing a home to, you know, infertility and, and, you know, and multiple marriages and infidelity. And, you know, it's like, it's like all of this stuff, um, that you have gone through, whether you understood it in the moment has been a, uh, like you said, uh, a tool to, to give you, um, 
the life that you have now and the ability to be able to help other people who may be going through any one of those challenges, right? Like, and because you have experience, you've got wisdom. Yes. Um, and, and I think one of the most important things and, and one of your chapters in your book, as we talk about here in, in the section of seeing is really gaining perspective, mm -hmm. right? And so it would be really easy for you, I imagine, and I know it has been for myself in a lot of ways to like, to look at the challenges of our past with, with a different lens. Yes. Um, and so kind of talk to me a little bit about how, you know, shifting perspective or, or the type of perspective that you had on a situation, um, you know, hindered you, but then also has now empowered you. Yeah, there's a quote I love. It's, you know, your perspective can either become your prison or your passport. And I think it's so true. And we have the choice to make in that. And, you know, for, you know, early in my life, I kept feeling like I'm losing time. I'm losing speed because, you know, I was, you know, supposed to be here at 22 and here at 26 and here at 30. And, you know, by 30, I wanted to have five kids. You know, I hadn't had, I was having my first and then my second marriage. And, you know, and so my our perspective early on was like, all of the time I'm losing and the speed I'm losing and the momentum. And cause I had big things and I felt like this is never going to happen because like things are not going the way I had planned. <laughs> Christy had a plan and it is not going the way it's planned. And so, but I had to, it's somewhere along the way I had to shift that perspective and just realize that I had to embrace this and I had to start growing through it. And I think that shift of, cause I'm still going, we all are, but I still have stuff I'm dealing with, you know, and fighting. Mm. And I have literally just accepted the fact that adversity is part of life. And if I'm going to wait, because you know, my view early on is like, I'll be happy when, you know, how many people said that I'll be happy when, yeah. and I had to realize like, I am never going to say that again. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be happy right now in the midst of turmoil, chaos, whatever. And look at the things that I have went through with the perspective lens of, I am the person I am today. I have the empathy I have for other people, the compassion, because I was a very critical at 19. I was the person that's like, get your crap together. What is your problem? Like, why, <laughs> what's the matter with you people? And then yeah. life starts slapping you in the face and you're like, mm, maybe I don't, I shouldn't say that anymore. Do you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and so now I can empathize with people that want like me that want change, that want to get through, but they just don't even know what to do to get to the other side. And it's mm. like, I do know that. And I know what it feels like to hurt so bad and struggle so hard that you're just like, I don't even think I can do this one more day and everything in between. Yeah. And, and I mean, you don't know what you don't know until you know mm -hmm. that you don't know it. Right. Correct. And, um, and so it's, it's gaining perspective, um, is in and of itself a process. It's not just yes. like, a uh, Oh, now I, now I know, um, mm -hmm. you, you almost don't really gain perspective until you've gone through things and can come out on the other side of those challenges, yes. which give you a broader view of stuff. But then using that tool, um, to go back and look at everything, mm -hmm. um, and new situations and having that perspective, um, is a great way, as you say in your book too, to stay grounded. Yes. Right. Um, and, and, but once you have that self-awareness, once you've started to gain perspective on your circumstances, it kind of brings you into the next thing that you had just touched on a little bit is that, you know, we're all growing through things, um, which is a unique perspective yes. on what we're going through. Um, and you know, you have a couple of different chapters that talk about this, the, the growth mindset and, um, you know, things aren't necessarily happening to you, they're happening mm -hmm. for you. Right. And so, um, so let's kind of talk to our audience a little bit about like this idea of growing through things. Um, you know, how can you, if you're in the midst of something right now, gain that perspective so that you can grow through it? What would be some practical advice for that? Yeah, I think it's, um, part of it is being willing to look at it from, you know, not play the victim, which we all have did probably at parts in our life and continue, you know, but to look and go, okay, this adversity is a gift for me right now. Like it's trying to teach me something. It's trying to grow me into the person I can become. It's trying to do something for me. But I think as a society and as a people, we don't like discomfort. We don't like pain. We don't like, you know, naturally. And so hmm. we, we tend to want to, you know, think that, oh, this is hard. So I need to, you know, exit and, and not all hard needs to be, you know, we need to embrace that pain as I call it and, and start to grow through it. And I think, you know, the best, probably one of the best examples I have of this in my personal life is my marriage, is my marriage with Matt. Uh, you know, we've been married almost 19 years and it was hell on earth for the first five years. I was a 
broken mess. And he was like, mm. I thought we were just going to get married and watch movies and have fun, you know? And, <laughs> and so, you know, we were like to, and, but, and there were many times that we talked about leaving, but instead we decided like, can we grow through this? Can we somehow, you know, go, grow through the pain that we're growing through and causing each other? Can we somehow leverage our strengths together? And, and really, and now we have like, you know, a, 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 a a great relationship. It's not perfect. It still needs improvement, but like we work together well, like people admire us all the time. And I don't say that from an arrogant standpoint, but people are like, Oh, you guys are so lucky. And it's like, no, this is nothing to do with luck. We chose mm. to grow through this together and it, and change, you know, together to make what we have today. And so I think, you know, whatever situation that the listener is in, or you're going through right now, I think if you can look at it, and instead of like, all oh, this keeps happening to me, or this is so hard and go like, what can I, cause the sooner you can do that, the sooner you can get out of it too. <laughs> Honestly, mm -hmm. you know, the sooner that you can embrace the grief and let you process the emotions and walk through it, the sooner that you can let go of the bitterness, the sooner that you can do those things, you can get to the other side. And I don't, does that answer your question or I'm just. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love that. And it's, you know, I've, I, I can look at my own life and see in so many different ways in which I played the victim and, mm -hmm. and I've, you know, continue to do that, right? It, because there's something in us that's just, that believes like this is happening to me and it's, you know, it's the world's against me. The circumstances are against mm -hmm. me. This cards are stacked against me. It's just yes. the hand I dealt, right? Like we've got, mm -hmm. we've got idioms and phrases that describe this victim mentality. Yes. That's just a part of our culture in so many ways, mm -hmm. at least here, um, you know, in the U S and, and where I've been. And so it's like, that perspective um, mm -hmm. that you have of even just shifting from I'm not the victim and this isn't happening to me, it's happening for me. So how can I grow through this and come out the other side as a better person is just so powerful. And I think um, I think the next question then is, well, you know, why would I want to do that or how would I do that? Um, and I think uh, I think what you talk about as far as being able to know your purpose Mm -hmm. Right. It's like when you can identify the reason why you're on this earth, even if it's just to love your family well, or if it's to, you know, just be a good husband, daughter, brother, whatever it is, like what, what is your purpose and identifying that purpose is what can help you to, to drive your life forward. Right. Yes. Um, and so, you know, kind of talk to us a little bit. I mean, obviously you had that vision, which gave you your purpose, but talk to us a little bit about being able to know your purpose and how maybe somebody could, could work to identify what that might be. Yeah, we all hear, hear the, you know, know your why and, you know, you walk through stuff like this in workshops and it's like, and people come up with these generic phrases and, but I, what I have experienced with knowing your purpose and helping people to do that is your purpose has to be something so compelling and so, you know, that's just naturally pulling you forward so that, you know, I heard it described once, I don't know, but you know, when you're standing in horse manure, like if you're just looking down <laughs> at the horse manure you're standing in, it's hard to see anything else, you know, it's, but if you, if you, you could still be standing in that same horse manure, but if you can look out over the horizon and you know where you're headed and you know why you're headed there, then it doesn't matter what you're standing in right now because that is pulling you forward out of that. But it can't be your, and the other myth that you touched, I mean, is you, you, your purpose doesn't have to be world changing. Like, you know, we all can't, you know, we all aren't, aren't meant to be Oprah or some big name of somebody doing like your purpose could be like being an amazing wife and mother. It could be, you know, being a bit, it, it could be being a CPA. It could be, it could be anything, but the key is knowing, you know, the question that I, um, this isn't my question, but it's one that helps people identify their purpose is how, how are people's lives better when they cross my path? Like, what is that thing that mm. you're doing for other people? You know? And so when I'm living true to Christie's values and purpose, um, which are, you know, freedom, adding value to people and growth, like that can look many different ways that can be on a stage talking to a bunch of people and inspiring them. But that can also be me taking coffee to the car wash guys on a day when it's hot out, you know, and taking them iced coffee and saying here, like, so I can live my purpose in all different ways. But when you know your purpose, it gives you that reason to get up in the morning. It gives you that. And I think when you start feeling like you're going through just the motions and there's no end in sight and what's the point of it, you know, we're, we're looking as human beings, we're craving that, that purpose, that fulfillment. And when you start yeah. just feeling like you're on that hamster wheel every day, life sucks like that, you know, <laughs> and it does. Yeah. And, you know, I think you just need to, you've got to take the time to identify that. Yeah. And, and 
so um, just as kind of a summary of what we've been walking through, it's like, you know, in that in the C section of your book, we're talking about gaining perspective either on yourself or your circumstances. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, right now kind of talking about this believe part of of that process where, you know, you you really at your core need to believe that one, like you're valuable enough to to have a purpose and be deserving yes. of a purpose and that you have something to contribute to your community or the world or whatever it might be. And you you're not going to know until first you believe in yourself to be able to do that sure. and then you try it right and so I, I love how you have that and it brings us into the last section of your book which is is the doing part um, and uh, and one of the things that stood out to me in, in what you were talking about which I think is a good segue into this section is you know being able to find joy in the journey um, mm -hmm. I think our world at least in my experience in many different ways is concerned with happiness Yes. Um, which, uh, which obviously you talk about, um, and it's this idea that like, well, what do I need to do to be happy? If, if I just, if I just had this, if I just mm -hmm. was able to do that, if I just had a better job, then I would be happy and things would mm -hmm. be okay. Um, and what, what we've learned is, you know, the richest people aren't necessarily happy, right? Yes. They, they have all the things, but they're not happy. Mm -hmm. So, um, kind of talk with us a little bit, um, from your perspective of, of this idea of finding joy in the journey and, and how we might go about doing that yeah like i mentioned before just what you're saying like happiness isn't bad and happy is a strong good emotion that we feel from time to time but when you chase that it doesn't end well and so but joy for me is something deeper it runs below the circumstances it runs below you know everything going on around you and i think the key the formula for me because you know, for a while, I kind of fought this idea of, well, I don't want to be happy where I'm at because I don't want to be where I'm at. And if I decide <laughs> to be content and happy here, then I'm not going to get here, you know? Mm. And I realized it's not one or the other. I, every single day, I, Matt and I laugh so much. Like, and my kids are like, mom, like I, when I'm gone, they miss me. Like they're like, mom, it was so boring here without you. And, <laughs> and we just laugh all the time about everything under the sun. And it's not because our life is great and perfect and all of that, but I have learned that I can find joy right where I'm at. I can grow right where I'm planted and be content while looking towards that purpose and vision and, and actually moving and taking action towards something better. So it's mm. not, you know, I'm going to be, and I learned this actually from a missionary that I did um, work for at a nonprofit years ago when I lived in St. Louis and they would move every couple months overseas. And she said, I learned to never live temporarily. If we're going to be in an apartment for three months, I'm putting up pictures and I'm making it home and we're going to spend these three months the best we can. And I, that mm. never left me. And I, and I've learned that in, I have today and that's all I'm promised right this moment. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. if, but you don't have to sacrifice, like you don't, just because you're finding joy where you're at doesn't mean you can't get to a better place. And I think that's been the, the formula. I mean, there's more tips on this in my book, I'm sure. Um, yeah. but the, that's been the one key factor for me that I have, you know, been in my life and I live it. I, you know, we find joy every time in the craziest circumstances. We laugh probably about things and most people be like, why are you laughing about that? But because <laughs> it's just like laugh or cry, you know, and I've did my share of crying. So. <laughs> well, I love that idea of, of not living temporarily. That's mm -hmm. a, a, that's a good tagline right there. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think too, like you're talking about is a lot of times we have the tendency to equate uh, contentment with settling for our yes. current circumstances. Right. Yes. And that's what you're saying is like, Correct. you can be content without settling. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's a, I think that's a great perspective to have. Yes. Um, so there's two things that I think I want to, I want to finalize our conversation with here, and then I'll, I'll have a couple of closing questions for you. But, um, there's really two things here that I think are extremely important for people as they're going through this journey. Um, of we call life right and yes. and um and that's having a good support system um and uh and self care right and those yes. are two things that you do cover in your book and and some things that you talk about um you know from stage and in your workshops and stuff like that as well um but what's um you know having a good support system is uh, is easy if you were born into a good support system, let's say, mm -hmm. right? Um, but for people that don't have a healthy uh, family structure or maybe, you know, a, a, an aware friends group or something like that, um, maybe finding a support structure is a little bit more difficult. So, you know, kind of talk with us a little bit about that support system and how it worked in your life and, and maybe some places where, where people can look and uh, to try to be able to build that for themselves too. 
Yeah, a support system has been key in my life, and it hasn't come from a lot of people. It's come from very few, actually, but it's mm. been having the right support. And I'm a very independent, self-sufficient person. I, I have learned to depend on other people, but I still struggle with that. I'm a person that's just like, I'd rather be on my shoulders, get the jobs. You want the job done? Do it. You know, I don't need anybody. Yeah. Just let me do it. You know, but then life starts hitting you in the face, like we talked about. And I realized maybe Christy doesn't really have all this together herself. And so <laughs> I think, you know, for me, Matt has been a key support in my, when I married Matt, I, when I was, I had been through a marriage uh, with a lackadaisical husband and somebody that didn't really. And, you know, at first glance, Matt was a similar personality type. And I had a list of what I wanted and he knew that list. And he's like, I don't measure up on this list. I'm like, I know you don't, but. <laughs> You know, but I didn't, you know, God knew what the next 20 years held. And he knew like Christy needs a mat in her life or she's not going to survive to the other side, you know? And, mm. and so he has been, you know, and my parents have been a key support and a couple pastor friends of ours. And there's been, cause when I went through, you know, my mental health battle, a lot of people didn't understand it. It wasn't talked about even like it is today. And when I tried to talk to a couple close friends about it, they didn't get it. And I immediately realized I can't go there with people. I have to figure this out myself. And so through mm. that battle, you know, I had my mom and I had Matt and, you know, that was about it, but it was enough to get me to the other side. And so whatever you're facing, but, and the other thing I do want to say about support system is you've got to have somebody, you know, don't go try to talk to somebody about marriage that's been married four times and hates their current marriage. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> that doesn't work. You know, nobody yeah. wants a fitness coach that's, you know, 500 pounds and sitting there eating potato chips while he or she's telling you what to do. You know, you've got to go find somebody. When Matt and I looked for marriage advice, we went and found the couple that was happily married 35 years and said, help us, you know? And so when you're looking for that support, go, it might not be the person you th think it, that's the other thing I've learned. The mm -hmm. people you think should support you, or you even want support from might not be your people the to right support ones. you through what you're going through. And, but the, it doesn't change the point that we're making that you need a support system. You cannot and shouldn't do it alone, you know? And if you, if you can find that person or couple people, it will make a world of difference. I love that. Um, and then in the interim, right? And so mm -hmm. as we're as we're doing this, a big important part of um, of our journeys as people is understanding. Um, you know, you, you talk about setting boundaries, which I think is a yes. part of this as well, which is sure. which is that self care, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we how do we care for ourselves in a way that um, uh, gives us a cup in which we can. Um, you know, sort of retain some of this stuff and, and be able to pour out for others or, or to have the energy to face these circumstances. Um, yeah. Yeah. I used to think self-care and rest was like lazy. And I'm like, listen, watching TV all day does not do me good, any good. I want to kill myself. Like, I don't like to watch TV. I don't like to sit around like, and so I always equated rest with like, I can't do this. And so I think the first point in self-care is know yourself and understand yourself and understand because you know, self-care and filling your tank and refueling you is what brings you joy. That's different. Like my husband, again, he could sit and play a video game for three hours and feel like amazing after I would want to cry. Like I, you know, and so, but I could clean my house honestly for three hours and be totally happy because I like to clean my house, you know? And so, hmm. um, I think it's knowing what fills you up. It doesn't have to look like something that everybody else does. And so I think understanding what does self-care look like for you is the first, is one of the keys in actually doing proper self-care. Cause we get these, you know, books or handouts or people say, this is my self-care regimen. And you're like, okay, I need to do what so-and-so does. Cause she's got, you know, and then you try to do it and it's like, it doesn't work you know, because mm. it's not you, you know? And so I think, but you do need to, you know, when you're on an airplane, they tell you what happens if the oxygen mask falls, you've got to put it on first so you can help the other people. And I find two ends of the spectrum when people aren't doing self-care, either they're on the end where they feel like, oh, well, that's, you know, I'm, I'm just the martyr. I don't have time. I have to take care of everybody else. Or they feel like self-care is self-absorption and like, you know, it's just all about, and it's neither of those things, you know, but I mm. have to take care of myself so that I have the capacity to go live my purpose. And mm. same with the listener. You've got to start taking care of yourself, but it doesn't need to look a certain way. You know, it needs to look like I have a handout that I, that's in the, there's a thing in the book and there's a handout that um, is a free download. I can get the link for you, but it's refueling stations for your life. And the idea of this yeah. for me came from John Maxwell, but he had nourishing stations, I think, but it's filling out those different things, music, books, people, places, you know, hobbies that fuel you. And knowing what those things are so that when your battery starts to go low, you can go back to those things and refuel, refuel it. 
Yeah, that's huge. Um, I know that's, I never, I never understood or took the time to understand what my own needs were. Right. Mm -hmm. And so yes. it was impossible for me to be able to care for myself because I didn't even, I didn't pay attention enough to Correct. even realize what I needed in the first place. And so you do have to identify like, well, what do I need? Is it a break? Is it time away? Is yes. it, is it more interaction with people? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, is it exercise? Um, mm -hmm. you know, is it a change in my diet? I mean, it could be anything, but all yes. of those things help to contribute to, um, you know, to, to give you the ability to then really be able to help people. Otherwise you'll just get burnt out and, and, yes. um, you know, not be able to, to pursue your passion, uh, and purpose as you talk right. about. So, um, so great. I, I mean, this has been very insightful even for me and kind of talking through this. Um, and so a couple of things to sort of close us out here, first of all, like, you know, of everything that we've sort of talked about and we've and woven through today, I think you've got some really great advice that you have shared. But if there was like one thing in particular that you feel like you wanted to uh, leave our listeners with today, like what would what do you think would be that that one thing that you feel like would really sort of resonate and, and help them on their own journey? I think just based on this conversation, this isn't what I plan to say is um, the. <laughs> I think you must make investing in yourself a priority. Like you must get to know yourself. I mean, I could talk to you for 10 hours about self-awareness. I might just write a book on it because it's, you know, it's just been huge in my life and taking the time to get to know myself. And, and that's not going to happen overnight, but the key to doing that is reflecting on every experience. Like reflection turns experience into insight. If you can stop and reflect on that experience and grab the insight from it, and then you, you put that in your toolbox, you, put that as part of your life, you build it into your life, then the next one, you reflection turns. But you've got to take time to invest in yourself because you are worth it. And you have a purpose out there that nobody else was put on this earth to do. But you have to be able to know yourself, grow yourself, become the person that can actually carry out that purpose. And it's an it's a process of evolution. Look, the four weeks after I turned the corner for my mental health, I started sharing my story and helping other people. I was far from out of that battle. I'm, you know, I'm still coming out of that battle. And so, but I have been able to help people in the process because I've been getting myself better in the process. And so you need to take the time to invest in yourself and know yourself and find that purpose. I think it really starts there because otherwise you can do all of the things like I was, I'm an action, but when you're not doing them from a place of health in all aspects, it, it doesn't go anywhere, you know? And so start with you because that's the only thing in person you can change. So you kind of touched on this a little bit and, and the purpose and point of this context, a lot of ways is, is to help people share their stories and talk about what they're doing and how they're helping other people, which, mm -hmm. you know, we've been talking about here and kind of how you help other people. Um, but in, in sharing your story, like you just mentioned, you've been able to really make a greater impact and you've embraced all parts of your story and have shared those things. Mm -hmm. So can you, um, can you kind of share a little bit to the entrepreneur that might be listening sure. or the person who thinks that they don't have a story worth sharing, um, how in valuable it's been uh to to embrace your story and to share it yeah having not having a story worth sharing i've heard that a hundred times and more. <laughs> um because i used to lead a sales team years ago that's another story um from what helped me turn the corner and and that business blew up for me because i shared my story you know and my team would go well i don't have your story i'm like no and then they would try to be like me and it doesn't work i'm like no you guys stop like you're not me you haven't lived this you're not my story like find your story. And so I think the two mm. keys of that is you do have a story that's going to resonate because my story doesn't resonate with everybody. My personality doesn't resonate with everybody and same for you. And so if you will find your story, it can, it doesn't have to be like earth shattering or dramatic, but if you will dig deep, you have a story. And, but the other side of that is you have to be willing to share that story, you know, and so mm. many people I worked with and, yeah. you know, even my clients that are like, wanting to build it. They're like, well, I have a story, but I'm afraid to share it, you know? And the thing, and cause even people will come up to me and say, Christy, like, how do you like talk about some of this stuff? And I'm like, because <laughs> yeah. it's not about me. My mindset coach years ago told me, Christy, you have to live in the duality of this has everything to do with you. Cause it's all about you and your story, but it has nothing to do with you. And that's the duality that I live in every single day is this 
I only tell my story to help other people. I could care less mm. about you telling you my story, but I am willing to use it to help you because I'm not, it's not a, I'm not insecure about it. I don't care what you think of me. I'm doing it to help the people that it can help. And so I think that, you know, you have, and you have to stay true to your story because when you start to try to take somebody else's story or make your, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't. Mm. People can see right through that. But if you will have the courage to get to know your story and then share it, I think as, as an entrepreneur, like that is the difference maker. And that's the thing that nobody can take from you. Like I don't sit around every day wonder, worrying about people stealing my material or getting, being a better speaker than me or, and, cause I'm like, I, nobody can take my story. Nobody can take my personality. Nobody can take the person I've become. Like you can't duplicate those things. And so mm -hmm. I think that's where it's been powerful for me in building businesses. And I think it's just getting people over that. It, it, either an insecurity or a fear of rejection, or there's different things that drive that in people. But I, I, I love that. I say almost verbatim so many things like that to our clients <laughs> okay. as well as we're working with stories, just of like, you know, you're <clears throat> anybody can come in and copy your goods and services. Sure. Like th that is duplicable. But mm -hmm. your story and you are not. And it's the Correct. very thing that's going to attract your ideal clients because yeah. they resonate with you. It's like, you know, the snowflakes and the fingerprints and all the kind of different analogies that you could use yes. to, to show this. And so I, I love that you're saying that because um, it's probably good for people to hear it from somebody uh, other than me who's been through, um, you know, a world <laughs> of experience too. So thank you. <laughs> and there's a quote from my mentor that I love and I think will resonate with the entrepreneur. It's love me or hate me, but there's no money in the middle. And, you know, and so <laughs> when you are true to yourself, you know, either people are going to resonate with that and love that, or there's somebody else for them, but, but you can't make, you know, you can't try to be everything to everybody. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I love that advice. And I think that's a great place for us to kind of wrap it all together. Love me or hate me, but there's no money in the middle. <laughs> that yeah. uh, sums it all up right there. But, uh, well, Christy, thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, it's been a, a pleasure talking with you and, um, I've really enjoyed your insights and, and the wisdom that you've been able to share today. And, uh, just appreciate you taking your time out to, to do that for us today. Thanks for having me. I, uh, anytime I can help somebody, I'm all for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, and thank all of you for listening. Um, and as always, hopefully you found some valuable information today. Um, and if you did, please like, subscribe, uh, buy Christie's book. There'll be a link in the description uh, for you to be able to do that. There's a lot of great and more wisdom in there than she was even able to share today uh, with some really powerful and impactful stories. Uh, and until next time, keep elevating and accelerating. Thanks. Thanks.